You're listening to the Based on History podcast. All units, Irene. I say again, Irene. And we're going to kick him in the ass. We're going to kick the hell out of him all the time. And we're going to go through him like crap through a goose. You tell him I'm coming. And hell's coming with me, you hear? Hell's coming with me. That they may take our lives. But they'll never take our freedom. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Howdy everyone, welcome back to the Based on History podcast, and today I've got a mini episode for you, and we're going to talk about a few books that I think would make really good historical movies and some of my thoughts about them and how I, one, it would be cool to see these brought onto screen, and two, it'd give me some more episodes uh, to do. But, um, yeah, we'll just dive in. And the first one that I was going to, well, I always kind of thought about this book wanting to be a movie, but then they did it. And that is, the book is called Horse Soldiers, and the movie is called 12 Strong. I'm planning on covering that one in a future episode because it's already been made into a movie. Um, but I brought it up because it was a a book that I really, really liked. And for a few years after I had read it, I was always thinking like, man, this would make such a cool movie. And then the movie came out. Now, don't get me wrong. I like the movie. I I would consider the movie to be really good, but not great. It leaves a lot to be desired in in that movie. And I think they could have, there's a lot they could have done to, to make it better. And I don't want to say too much about it because I'll talk about those things in that podcast. But that's an example of, you know, when I was younger, I was like, man, this is going to make such a cool movie. And yeah, like I said, the movie's not bad. But we'll start off with the first book. And the reason the reason I brought up Horse Soldiers is because of this because of this first book. And I view them almost as companion books. Now, the book I'm about to mention came out first, but chronologically, it comes second. And that is Not a Good Day to Die. And that book is by Sean Naylor. And this is the story of Operation Anaconda. And it's the first major large-scale conven- using conventional forces in Afghanistan after after 9-11. And the reason I bring up horse soldiers in this book at the same time is because, like I said, I view them almost as companion books because horse soldiers is about the special forces groups that went into Afghanistan with the um, alliance and basically routed out the Taliban and al-Qaeda forces that were controlling the country and controlling the passes and some key cities and things like that. You know, riding on horseback, using air support, and all of that. Now that they've they kind of completed that mission, they move into the next phase of Afghanistan of the Afghan conflict, and that is, where are the survivors of these different groups of Taliban, different groups of Al-Qaeda, where are they going? And then obviously, the kind of hunt for bin Laden is, as well. And they find them in this in this valley, and they get some tips that bin Laden could be there. Now, I don't want to go into too, too much detail, because I don't want to spoil the book or necessarily the future movie. But you've got the 101st Airborne, you've got the 10th Mountain Division, you've got some Delta Force, Navy SEALs, Army Green Berets, in conjunction with some Afghan fighters working working with the U.S. And they devise this plan, this kind of hammer and anvil strategy. They're going to plug up all the gaps, and they're going to move through the valley, and they're going to kill or capture any anybody that's that's in there. And anybody who knows about Operation Anaconda knows that it goes horribly wrong. And uh, when I say horribly, 
the overall objective of the battle, I would say, is a, is a U.S. victory. But from the planning to the execution to what actually unfolds on the ground, it's, it's a massive mess of confusion and things that they should have known, things that they did know and ignored due to one part of the planning or well, this person in the planning phase and their agenda and things like that. And, and it turns into a completely different type of battle than what they had hoped for. Now, we all know that even the best plan doesn't survive first contact, but this is a little bit different than just having to revise and be fluid in your thinking and update your tactics and, and, and things like that. This is, it's a mess. And it's a testament to the soldiers on the ground and, and, and what they were able to achieve. But Not a Good Day to Die, is a, it's a very, very good book. And it directly follows the events of Horse Soldiers. So I would recommend reading Horse Soldiers first and then Not a Good Day. Not a Good Day to Die. When I look at Not a Good Day to Die's movie, I see this as filmed very similar to like Black Hawk Down. It's a large-scale battle. It covers a lot of ground. You've got people in the valley. You've got people up in the mountains. There's, diff there's very clear divisions of units of what people are doing. And so I can see this movie being very much like Black Hawk Down, where you've got this very, very large ensemble cast of kind of clearly identified groups of men. And then therefore, you know, kind of like almost like a Black Hawk Down, We Were Soldiers combination. Because in We Were Soldiers, you have, you know, they're, they're holding an area, right? And so the movie would switch back and forth for like, it would say like, The Knoll, the Lost Platoon, HQ, the you know the the Creek Bed, th things like that, to help orient you throughout the movie as to where on this battlefield you are with this group of people, and yeah, I would see that being done very well, or to make this movie better because you've got you've got groups of 101st Airborne, you've got groups of guys on the mortars you've got the delta operators and overwatch you've got the navy seals on the top of the mountain you've you know you've got a whole bunch of different very clear different groups of people and i can see that being a way to help organize this massive battlefield with massive amounts of people and it could get kind of chaotic if you try and do it strictly linear you would kind of get lost And so you would need to clearly identify all, all of those types of things. And both of those movies that I mentioned do that do that very well. And so you would need to do something like that for this this movie to to be to be done well. All right, moving on. The next book that I'd like to see turn into a movie is White Devil, and this is by Stephen Brumwell. And the subtitle is A True Story of War, Savagery, and Vengeance in Colonial America. This book is about Robert's Rangers or and uh, Robert Rogers, who is the forefather of the U.S. Army Rangers. They trace their lineage back to him, and the French and Indian War doesn't get a lot of screen time. I mean, the only movie that really pops up into my mind is the uh, Last of the Mohicans, which is obviously a historical fiction in an, ama in an amazing movie. Um, the only other one that I can really think of is this kind of made-for-TV movie called The Broken Chain, which has some events that take place during the French Indian War and some that take place during the American War for Independence. But there's not very many. And it's this unique time in American history where the U.S. is not the U.S. yet, but They're very clearly different than the the British, and they fight they fight that way. And the British rely he the well the French and the British both rely heavily on colonial and Indian allies in this war. It's on the frontier, and it's funny to think that the frontier is places like Ohio, upstate New York, parts of. Kentucky and Virginia, things like that, which now is like the East Coast almost. But um, in the 1750s, it was the frontier. And 
Robert Rogers is a very unique, interesting historical figure that goes from American hero to almost American villain in the American Revolution because he retains his allegiance to the crown and fights for the British in the American Revolution. But the things he he does in this well in in his real life are accounted in this book are are extraordinary from the raids that they do on deep into enemy territory on on in Indian villages and the scouting that they're able to do for the more conventional British forces um it's brutal it's brutal stuff anytime you're dealing with the kind of Indian way of warfare it it's brutal and it's brutal especially in comparison to the way that most warfare was being conducted at that time we're at the you know the the height of kind of gentlemanly combat and you see that in movies like the patriot and and you know some other movies where they're all in lines and they you fire now we fire now you fire now we fire and oh yes you know jolly good you know we'll get you next time uh kind of a thing and the their Indian allies did not fight like that, and they relied heavily on them because France and England are obviously both across the ocean, and so there. And then later on, you've got the Seven Years' War that goes on in Europe, and, and the rest of the war. This is all kind of jo- joined together, and so their forces are committed elsewhere, and both the French and the English are having to ship forces across the Atlantic to fight in this war and they don't have enough. And so they're relying hev- the British rely heavily on their colonial forces and some Indian allies and the French rely extensively on the Indian tribes in in their area. And their way of fighting is just very very different and this book does a very good job of illustrating that type of combat. It doesn't make any excuses. This is how it was in history. I don't care what your modern day politics are. They don't matter to history. They don't matter. And whether you're a Indian fighting for the French or Indian fighting for the British or a colonial or a frontier settler, you're going to be affected by this brutal style of combat i.e. raids, you know, scalping, very much close hand-to-hand combat that is the the Indian way. And this book gives you an account of what what it was like. And I think it does a, I think it does a very good job. And so and the, one of the reasons why I would like to see this made into a movie is because I I do love the movie Last of the Mohicans. I love it so much. I think it's an amazing movie. It's much better than the than the book that it's um, that its source material comes from. But there's not, like I said, there's not very many of those out there. So I want more. I want more. And this is one where you have a clear leader in Robert Rogers, and you have his group of men, and there's a main focus on what they are doing throughout this war. And it would be, I think, it would be very easy to translate that into into a movie there's this one in particular raid that there's a there's a raid and a couple battles that he's that he's famous for and you could build that movie around this and you wouldn't necessarily have to have the grand scale warfare that happens in the French Indian War happening as 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 well because you could kind of get lost because you have a bunch of fort sieges and fort battles and things like that. And I'm not saying that those couldn't be included in some way, some way, shape, or form because his unit does partake in some of those. But it would be cool to see this kind of French Union War Special Forces unit doing Special Forces things during that time with the equipment and the knowledge and the know-how that they had had at that time. And, yeah, I just... I think uh, I think it's a great book, and I think it'd be a very cool movie. All right, moving on. The next book that I want to talk about is called The Last Battle. This is by Stephen Harding, and this book is in reference to the battle for Castle Itter, and this is one of only two times in World War II 
where U.S. forces and German soldiers fought together t- against the SS. And this battle revolves around... So Castle Itter is a POW camp, essentially. And there's a bunch of kind of high-profile prisoners. I think there's like a French tennis player, a few other kind of high-profile um, prisoners of war held there. And the German army, which is in control of this this town and the and the castle... It's in the waning days of World War II, and they realize Germany's not going to win. And they basically have orders that the SS are going to come in and take over this town and take over this area. And they know what that means. It means that all of these prisoners of war are going to be executed. And they're kind of realizing that they need to be on the right side of this. And also, I think a lot of the spit and polish of Nazi Germany has worn off for a lot of these guys. And and they're beginning to realize, hey, like, this is, we love Germany. We want to defend our homeland. But this is coming to an end, and it's coming to an end quick. And I think their moral conscience finally breaks through, and they have the ability to say, you know what, no. Right now, in this instance, we're going to do what's right. And they get in contact with a U.S., uh, unit, and they kind of, for lack of a better word, the U.S. blitz up to the castle, set up a perimeter, and there's a, I mean, it's not a massive battle, but it's a fairly, you know, large-scale uh, fight and to protect to protect these prisoners of war. I'm, like I said, I'm not going to get into too, too much detail of all of these uh, books so that I don't spoil anything for you whenever you read them, but it's a very unique time in World War II and it's very, very interesting to to read about. So I I, I highly suggest, I've only read part of the book actually because um, I actually got this book from my brother for Christmas one year, and I can't remember where what, I I started reading it because he had it, and then I I wasn't able to finish it. But um, what I have read is really good. He liked the book. Uh, we talked about how this would make a, a a really cool a really cool movie. And the next one I want to talk about, I said that the last battle was one of two times where U.S. forces fought with Germans against the SS. And that's bringing me to the second one, which is called Ghost Riders. And this is by Mark Felton. And this book is about Operation Cowboy. And once again, in the waning days of World War II, the Germans, who in this book are in control of the uh, Liberzoner horses... Um, which are from the Spanish Riding School in Austria and Vienna. And the Germans took all these horses. And if you know anything about Nazi Germany, you know that they had these kind of Aryan breeding facilities and trying to create the perfect human. Well, they were trying to do the same thing with horses. And so they confiscated all of these rare and important breeds from the areas that they controlled and they put them in these breeding facilities and had these German horse breeders and horse trainers work on creating a German perfect horse. And in the latter days of the war, this facility was going to be under threat from the Soviet forces. And because they had kind of, during the Yalta conference, they drew up lines that this is going to be the Soviet area of influence. It's going to be the U.S., the British, the French, and, and, and all of that. And the German soldiers who were at this stud farm and this mare breeding facility knew that if the Soviets got there, they would kill all and eat all these horses because they had already done it at a couple other facilities with with these kind of important horse breeds that they had, that they had taken because they needed the meat and they didn't care that they were, you know, culturally significant and and things of that nature and so they slaughtered all these horses in these previous um stables that they took and just ate it like a meal and so the germans realize that the soviets are on their way and if they get there all of these horses with hundreds and hundreds of years of breeding and bloodlines and significant importance to to different cultures are just going to be eaten again and so the germans set out to make contact with the U.S. forces and make a deal with them to say, hey, we'll surrender, you come in, 
rescue these horses and get all of them back onto U.S. lines so that they can be preserved. And the U.S. is not technically supposed to go into the Soviet area of influence, but this mission kind of speaks more to the heart than to the brain. And Patton, whose, ar- whose army is, is in control of this area that the Germans make contact with, is a former cavalryman himself and a lover of horses. And so it kind of strikes a, you know, a note with him, and he okays it. And so they come up with Operation Cowboy, and they use a reconnaissance brigade from a cavalry division, and or a cavalry regiment, excuse me, and a lot of these guys were former cavalrymen themselves or grew up riding or worked as cowboys and things like that. And so they they really had like, it's kind of, you know, they didn't, the Germans didn't pick these guys for that reason, but uh, it kind of worked out perfectly that, that you had all these guys who had the know-how to take care of these horses the right way. And they go about trying to rescue these horses. Well, while they're doing this, an SS division is moved into the area to kind of shore up that line of defense against the Americans and the Soviets. And so the Germans at the stud farm and the mare breeding facility, the Americans, some British, New Zealand, Polish POWs, some Cossacks that have defected from the, I think it's either the Soviets or the Germans. I can't remember which one they defected from, but you had some Cossacks there who are obviously horse lovers themselves. And then the German soldiers who are running this all fight together against this SS division that tries to 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 uh, attack them and it's a it's a it's a very cool story and just kind of like the last battle it's a very unique story within World War II um Mark Felton is not if memory serves me right, he's not a official historian he's an amateur historian and so the way he writes is much more well, I would say down to earth, easy to read, more like the co- common speech. And I mean that as a compliment. Um, so much with historians, they can get so bogged down into things that it's, you know, it's almost like reading the ingredients on the back of a cereal box. But um, with Mark, he's very, very much a, a storyteller. Um, and even if he is an actual historian, I, I apologize, but his writing style is much more a storyteller than a historian. Um, so I, I highly recommend that book. The next book uh, we're going to talk about is The Frozen Chosen, and this is by Thomas Cleaver. And this is the story of the 1st Marine Division and the Battle of the Chosen Reservoir in the Korean War. Kind of like I was talking about the White Devil and there not being very many French and Indian War movies, the only Korean War movie that can pop that pops into my head right now is Pork Chop Hill with Gregory Peck, and that's from like the '60s or you know, or maybe even the late '50s. I, I just, other than documentaries, I don't know of any Korean War movies, and I, I, I know I know there's a few out there. Um, I think there's one with Liam Neeson as as MacArthur and, and the kind of planning side of it, but that, to be honest. It, I haven't seen it. It's not supposed to be very good. But um, there aren't very many battle movies about the Korean War. And, and, and you know, there's a reason why they called this, in, in the United States, we call this the Forgotten the forgotten War. And I think it's time for the Korean War to kind of get its due when it comes to representing the heroics of these men who went and fought this war to help preserve South Korea as a free country. And my grandfather fought in the Korean War. He was with the 45th Infantry Division. And I I have this kind of personal connection because of my grandfather that I'm always like, man, like why doesn't the Korean War get its get its due? And the the chosen the Battle of the Chosen Reservoir is a is a good place to start because it's 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 one of the most brutal battles that the U.S. fights, the, the Marines and, and the Army, but the Marines take the brunt of it. And the best way I can describe the Battle of the Chosen Reservoir would be the Koreans, the Korean War's version of the Battle of the Bulge or Stalingrad, but al- like almost times 10 because the conditions that these guys are in are unbelievably brutal, unbelievably brutal. You've got 
millions of Chinese soldiers pouring over the border into the, the area that is now North Korea. And these U.S. soldiers and Marines fighting in, in the worst conditions that I can personally imagine because I hate the cold. If anybody knows me, you know that to be true. And you've got guys who are losing limbs to frostbite, bodies frozen in the snow, and um, yeah, it's it's intense. And then the, the slow retreat and the fighting retreat that these men do to give the wounded and other people time to get back to stabilize a defensive line, all, all, you know, all of the heroics, there's Medal of Honors that have been won, excuse me, that were won um, in this battle. And I think it'd be a good place to start and start in this kind of process of telling these stories of the Korean War. There's tons, there's tons of them. The Korean War needs to have its stories told. Um, And I think that this book would be a good, good starting point for movies to, to tell the story of of the, uh, of the Korean War. The next book I want to talk about is The Forgotten Soldier by Guy Sager. And this book is the story, it's the personal rememberings of a German soldier on the Eastern Front during World War II. And I think this paints a pretty good picture of the everyday soldier in the German army. Not the radical SS or the evil inner circle of Hitler and the politics that are going on or the concentration camps because we have to remember that most of the German military was made up of young young boys and this book really illustrates the process that those soldiers went through from the beginning of the war to the end of the war and the kind of raw spirit that they had of you know killing the Soviets and expanding German territory, you know, room to grow, Laban's room and, and, and all of that. And then the slow grind down by the Russian soldiers and that disillusion with Nazi Germany. And you see him go through all of that while he goes through pretty much every brutal thing you can think of on the Eastern Front. And this book has gotten some criticism from some historians as to it not being 100% accurate. And the author, Guy Sager, has come out and says, like, this is my remembering. This is how I remember it. If if I got a date wrong or a unit in this location wrong, that's 100% possible. But this is just my recounting as best as, as I can of what I remember going through on the Eastern Front during World War II. And... This he you know he starts off as a young private going through training, and then you see the process of him becoming a young soldier to kind of a into a battle hardened soldier, and then kind of into like a kind of crusty. I mean, he never gets old, really old in the book because he's still young, but you see that process. And I think it's important to remember that both sides of this, right? That. The German soldiers are not just completely free of all blame in World War II and the atrocities that that happened and that they they did. By by no means am I saying that. But I also think it's important that when you look at Germany, there are still a lot of normal, everyday people that got caught up in things they didn't fully understand or were led to believe. And then through this war, that you know, denazification process takes place because even when you're fighting for a Western power and you go and you deploy and things like that, the, the, the politics don't matter once the fighting starts. And the same is true of these German soldiers. They may be ardent Nazis. They may not be Nazis. But when they're there, when they're on the front lines and they're fighting, none of that matters because they're fighting for each other and they don't care who's in power, and they don't care what Hitler's personal agendas are. They just want to fight to to protect themselves, to protect their buddies, and to get home. And when you're fighting for an ideology like Nazism, 
and you start seeing these things and going through these things, then you kind of do begin to realize, hey, you know what? Maybe this isn't so good. Maybe this stuff is bad. It's like, why are we doing this? You know, for for Hitler, like, and you see him kind of go through that process. And I think it's a very interesting look at a young German soldier and what he goes through during during World War II. The next book, I almost said the next soldier. The next book I want to talk about is Empire of the Summer Moon, and this is by S. C. Gwynn. And this book is about the rise and fall of the Comanche Indians in North America, mainly Texas, New Mexico, parts of Oklahoma, Kansas, and Colorado. And this would be a hard movie to make because it spans over so much time. And I would really see this more like a miniseries. If you've seen the miniseries Into the West, which is pretty good, not great, but 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 pretty good. I would see it more along those lines where each episode where each episode would focus on a certain time period or a length of time about the the Comanche Indians. And being from Texas, the Comanches have always been my favorite Indian tribe for a multitude of reasons, but the the Comanches themselves are an extremely impressive group of people and I have extreme respect for them and their ability to um, essentially wage war and their culture and their fighting. And they are, in my opinion, the greatest Indian tribe in North America. I, I say that, but if I had to pick two, I would probably pick the Iroquois and the Comanche. And uh, they they never really came into contact with each other. But a lot of people say, "Well, what, what about the Sioux?" And it's like, "Well, the Sioux are impressive. There's a bunch of there's a bunch of impressive. I'm not I'm not belittling anyone, but I'll, I'll go into some of the reasons. They the Comanche were some of the first ones to get use of the horse from the Spanish, and they took that to a new level beyond anything any other tribe was able to. Even the other Plains Indians, and the Comanche ruled their empire, which was known as Comancheria with an iron fist and they were able to hold back European settlement to such a degree that no other tribe really was. At certain points in time during European expansion, the Comanches expanded their empire. They made treaties with the Spanish. They made treaties with the New Mexicans. They made treaties with the Texans and the U.S. Some of these are followed, obviously. Some of them are broken by both sides. And this book does one of the best jobs I've ever seen of kind of like what I was talking about with White Devil of, hey, you know what? Warfare is messy. History is messy. There's... Bad things done by the white settlers. There's bad things done by the Comanche. But you know what? We're going to talk about all of it because that's the way it was. And when you look at the Comanche, they are almost as a complete warrior culture as you can possibly can possibly be. The Comanche Indians didn't have a lot of traditions and a lot of art and a, a lot of those like elaborate headdresses. Some some of those things kind of come into play later on in, in, in their tribe's history. But for most of it, they are centered around essentially only two things, hunting buffalo and waging war. And the stories that are recounted in this book are, in my opinion, especially for modern audiences, better than, than most things that you're you're going to read. If you're interested in... The American West, you know, specifically kind of the Southwest, um, then you really need to check this book out. I, I can't speak highly, uh, highly enough of the, of this book. The next one I want to talk about is a West Pointer with the Boers. This is by John Blake. This is an autobiography of John Blake, who was a colonel or served as a colonel with the Boers during the Second Anglo Boer War, and he's an American former West Pointer who fought in the Indian Wars in the Southwest against the Apache. And he, I guess, kind of got tired of civilian life and then went to gold prospect in Rhodesia and then found his way into South Africa. 
And then the war kind of popped off, and he formed what was known as Blake's Irish Brigade. And it was made up of Americans and Irishmen and kind of foreign volunteers that fought for the Boers um, during the during the, the Second Boer War. And the Boer War is another war that doesn't get a lot of a lot of love in the movie industry. And I think it's a very unique war. It's kind of the precursor of warfare. You know, before you get to World War One, it's a it's a modern war, yet it still kind of has that old colonial feel feel to it. You've got m- some mechanized type things. You've got Gatlin guns and and things like that. But then you've also got the Boers who are operating mostly on horseback. It's a very clash of cultures uh, from the Boer farmers and this independent way of life to the British regulars and the strict British you know enforcement of things and. I would just love to see, I've always been interested in, in South Africa and the Boer War. Um, it's just always been very interesting to me. And it would be very cool to see, the The reason I chose this book to kind of represent the, the Boer War was that if an, an American movie, you almost need an American in the movie, and this American goes and fights with them, and it would be easy for American audiences to kind of relate to him or be int- more interested in the movie because there's an American in it. And, you know, you can take that for what it's worth. Uh, you know, like, it would still be interesting to see a movie about just, just the Boer War. But from a getting-the-movie-made perspective, it might be easier since there was an American figure that you could focus on with within the, the, the backdrop of the war. Moving on. Uh, the next book is called Four Ball, One Tracer. And this book is by... Uh, Rolf Van Herden and Andrew Hudson. And this book is about executive outcomes and the battles and wars in Angola and Sierra Leone. And executive outcomes is a private military uh, operating out of South Africa. And um, if you've seen the movie Blood Diamond, Leonardo DiCaprio works for executive outcomes and the guy who I can't remember his name, but he plays the mummy in the mummy, um, and he's the leader. I think he's a fictionalized version of this guy. But that kind of paramilitary group that you see at the end, um, trying to steal the diamond from Leonardo DiCaprio, um, is that that's executive outcomes. And in the mo- in Blood Diamond, they make them seem like greedy, bloodthirsty mercenaries, and. If you want to call them mercenaries, they are mercenaries. But this book allows you to see kind of the truth behind that uh, propaganda that's been put out about them and then the bad press that they've got and what they were able to achieve and the things that they were able to do in, in these wars and kind of just give a clear picture of what executive outcomes was about and honestly how successful they were in what they did. And you can take the good with the bad, just like with a lot of these things. But that's history. You know, that's that's history for you. And it's kind of a like a lot of these, a lesser known snippet of history that is interesting to learn about, interesting to read about, and would be interesting to see it brought on to uh, in, into a movie. And the last, we're kind of doing a bunch of uh, African ones here right at the end. But the last one I want to talk about is... The Cello Scouts, A Top Secret War. And this is by Lieutenant Colonel Ron Reed Daly, who was the leader of the Cello Scouts. And the Cello Scouts were a special operations unit for the Rhodesian forces during the uh, Bush Wars in Rhodesia. And during the 60s and 70s, you really see Rhodesia um, moving away from British control and figuring out what kind of country it's going to be. And that leads to infighting and civil war and different groups, the Zapu, the Zanu, all, all of these different kind of communist backed um, forces trying to take over the country in the name of, you know, majority representation, which, of course, that's not what it turns out to be. And then you've got the British who are not supporting the Rhodesians because they also want majority rule. Then you've got the Rhodesian minority trying to maintain their control and apartheid-style government and uh, all of those types of things. Um, But 
from a warfare perspective, the Cello Scouts may be one of the most effective anti-guerrilla, non-conventional forces in the history of warfare. And reading this book, it's kind of hard to find, but uh, and it's kind of expensive, but I highly recommend it. I highly, highly recommend it. Um, it really gives you an insight into how these men conducted non-conventional warfare and how unbelievably successful they they were at it. And a lot of these guys actually end up going to South Africa. Some of them end up being in executive outcomes and other other private uh, militaries of, of that sort. But the Rhodesian Bush War and that struggle from Rhodesia into modern day Zimbabwe is messy. It's very, very messy. But it's still part of history. And it's very interesting to read about. And I would love to see a movie about the Cello Scouts. There's a few operations they go on that are just, from a soldier's point of view, they're extremely impressive. Um, and, yeah, I, I highly recommend it. So that's the end of the list of books that I would like to see made in the movies. There's a, there's a lot more. These are just kind of some of the ones I picked from, you know, different wars and different perspectives and areas that don't have very many movies. I kind of tried to mix it up a, a little bit. Um, but I hope that y'all go out and check out some of these books. And I hope anybody who's listening that has the power to make <laughs> make movies uh, takes my advice because I would love to see some of these made, made in the films. Um, anyways, I hope this gives y'all some good recommendations to... Um, find good history books to read because I know, like I said earlier, it's hard to find good history books to read. Sometimes even if it's a a event that you like reading about, the history books can be boring. And these ones, these ones are really, really good reads. So thanks for listening. And I'm hard at work on the next uh, next episode. So be on the lookout for that. And that's all. See you next time. Adios.